How many people are working in your lab right now? Including me, about six people are working. I mean, we are about a total 12 people, a team. And then six of them right now intensely working on uh, Lyme-related projects. Were you the one that was actually doing these experiments? Obviously not. <laughs> so it was your team, right? Yes, my team. I have uh, very specialized people with a lot of skills to do animal experiment, oral gavage. It all needs a special skills. <laughs> Did this team come with you from the Indian Institute of Technology? Two of them were my former uh, uh, graduate students. Uh, the neurologist uh, is from, the, he got my PhD with my supervision from India. And the formulation chemist also, I trained him. He's also uh, my former graduate student. But they are not uh, directly came to my lab from India. One of them uh, joined my team after uh, his long training in Vanderbilt Pharmacology Institute. And another one got a very good training from University of California, Los Angeles. And uh, after that training, they joined my team. Other three people, they were trained by other experts in infectious agents. Uh, one of them from Borrelia lab, he came and then joined with us and then helping us. And another one from uh, trained from another lab, infectious uh, ID department, they came. So I assembled this team and then uh, they are doing this wonderful work. You know, I always wondered for the patient, for, for the people like that who are doing all this work, is do they feel like there's any satisfaction in the work that they're doing? Of course, uh, when um, uh, you know when they listen to all these stories of some positive effect, obviously they are all very happy. Can you tell us a little bit about any any high throughput screening that you are either doing or planning to do for Bartonella or Babesia? We just started the Bartonella screen. Um, we will, I think we will provide some good data to people in a month or two. There seems to be a general consensus among patients that disulfiram does not work for Bartonella. Many patients report that they feel like their Bartonella symptoms flare up when they're taking disulfiram. Do you feel that disulfiram has efficacy against Bartonella? And if so, how much? So one of the our clinical collaborator, he really thinks um, it uh, clears the Bartonella. So he arranged this collaboration for us. He wrote to somebody, asked them to send samples to us, and he helped us. Uh, so we just started that work, actually. Uh, we, we, I don't want to commit anything without, without I see the data and we are just uh, doing the results. Maybe it is uh, killing the Bartonella, maybe it is not, we don't know. I know you mentioned methylene blue. Uh, do you, have you done anything in your lab with methylene blue for Bartonella? Dr. Ingsan group, they published a paper to show methylene blue kills Bartonella. We have data to show it is killing Borrelia methylene blue. We also uh, published a paper how uh, methylene blue reduced the neuroinflammation dramatically. But we have papers to show how good it is. It seems like such an interesting molecule that it's a, it's a dye that also happens to have all of these benefits. That's correct. In fact, uh, uh, people uh, used it as an as a anti-malarial drug for some time. Methylene blue may do wonderful work, but it needs to go there, the place where it needs to be there. For that, you need to have a better uh, vasculature. Mm. So delivery is a problem. Always delivery is a problem. So do you think that you might be able to find a molecule similar to what you found for Borrelia for Bartonella? I really think so, yes. Do you think that this, because I know Ying Zhang, you said, has already done a high throughput screening for Bartonella. Do you think that he's done enough molecules? I, I know the paper actually where he showed that methylene blue is uh, killing Bartonella, but uh, I'm not sure about his screen size and all. We generally, even though we see other people's screen, we check in our screen with our own hand. We try to uh, finalize the molecule because our approach is slightly different. So is there anything that you have learned 
from being in the Facebook groups that has surprised you? Lot. <laughs> of course, a lot. I already told you that is uh, one of the greatest innovation that happened in recent days in drug development. It's a very innovative approach of assembling the people and then ask them to share their ideas, thoughts, and then all the clinicians can learn from that, all the patients learn from that, what to avoid, what to use, how to do. This is just an amazing, it's worth of a movie by itself. But nothing, nothing then, that, that changed your, your studies, meaning you, you started to do different things? No, it does. It does. Like, for example, I will be very careful, like when we design the trial, we tell people what to avoid, how to do it, and uh, we exclude a certain group of people who are likely to have very adverse events. And uh, we, like, we will advise them like, not to go near the fermented uh, food products like soya kind of preparations, and also the neuropathy how to deal with that and what kind of formulation likely to reduce that everything you know what is the cost of screening compounds for a disease for each disease so for example the borrelia screen to complete the screen uh, we spent around um, 500 to 600000 and you screened 5000 molecules uh, 700 uh, some uh, you know, uh, 7,500 molecules total. Uh, but, uh, you know, like uh, we need, it take it took a lot of time. The entire program at that time was funded by Bay Area Lime Foundation. But it only took you 600,000 to screen, to screen 7,000 compounds? Yeah, because we do as, a, you know, robots do that. So, so it's about... Uh, it, it's a more of people's time analyzing the data uh, rather than doing experiments because uh, somebody needs to be in charge and then we need to extensively screen it and analyze the data and after that we need to repeat it in in vitro. It's a lot of work and it, take, it took almost two, two to three years for us to complete it. So it's total expenditure. It is uh, automatic screen uh, but, the, you know, you spend a lot of time in setting the screen first, identifying proper method to find out the, the like in this case, Bartinola uh, death and how they die. Uh, those kind of questions you ans answer using carefully looking at the data. And after that, you need to repeat that in, in test tube, you know, like generally in high throughput screen on a plate where you have multiple wells and a robotic arm will be injecting everything. And then later you have to do it uh, in, in in vitro testing separately, you know, in a bulk level. Uh, it all takes a lot of time. I'm ta talking about the entire uh, thing, you know. How quickly though would you get from narrowing it down from 6,000 to 20 or so or 30? Maybe in uh, six months. Oh, that's fast. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about the funding that is required and what targeted work you would like to be pursuing? We got a small grant from uh, one of the foundation called Laurel STEM. And they helping us right now. If we are given like a like few millions, I would prefer to use that money to ask specific questions. Like for example, in human, um, how the pharmacokinetics changes uh, with the slow delivery, how it uh, increases the half-life of disulfiram, how it's getting into your different tissues, uh, what are the, why they develop side effects, any kind of genetic correlation with their ability to respond to the disulfiram therapy, and how the co-infections are cleared in human after Dysel, those kind of questions we wanted to answer and publish it so that people will get benefited. Pennies for dollars, you know. We're, we're trying to find ways to save money on the budget, but in saving a penny, we're losing a dollar here because for every person that's sick that can't work, they're losing, they're losing so much. They have to pay for those people. On top of that, they don't contribute. 
and those people's lives are also ruined and those people then become a burden to the people around the people that are sick so it's like the effects are extremely negative of this condition i mean you've yeah. done all the work that you've done with just a, a few million right not even around 1.5 million uh, for the period of uh, four years when we intensely funded well i have to say if you've done all this work over four years on one and a half million dollars or even anything close to that, even if it was two million dollars, I mean, this this is probably the best money that's ever been spent in the case of Lyme disease, right? I mean, we have 50, we have 50 years of history. People have been sick since the 1970s and there hasn't been a single molecule that could actually effectively yield a long lasting remission. There's never been a single molecule that could do that or treatment. And with that two and that one and a half million dollars, you're the first person that ever did that. Yeah, thank you for the kind words. I can't take total credit of that. It's a teamwork. Uh, myself and my lab mates, uh, we did all the work. And most importantly, the clinicians who was very careful, like Dr. Kenneth Lehner, who is very, very careful and then uh, reporting this and calling us and encouraging us, they played very, very, very important role. So if people, they don't report to us, we don't know whether it is working or not. So this really helped us uh, to, you know, put a lot of our efforts the cost to society that this disease has is so immense and it's almost immeasurable. It's probably in the hundreds of billions of dollars, I would assume, around the world globally. Yes. I mean, if you assume millions of people have it and the average person is producing, uh, has a, it contributes to the GDP, let's say the average person contributes uh, $60,000 a year to the GDP. So if 60 million people are producing an average of 30,000 of output per year and now they're disabled, that's 1.8 trillion. So let's let's just do the number for the United States just out of curiosity. That's still 180 billion dollars a year. If the government put a billion dollars toward Lyme disease, can you imagine what that would do? Yes. <laughs> it seems like it would be one of the best investments they could make. Wouldn't you agree? That's correct. Yes, I totally agree with you. I honestly find it very perplexing why Lyme disease wasn't something that was talked about in the literature much before the 1970s. Do you find that a little bit odd too? Uh, yes, because uh, my colleague uh, uh, Chris Newby wrote a book about that. It's certainly hard for most people to understand how this condition could have gotten so much worse all of a sudden out of nowhere, that maybe there was some man-made alteration in tick-borne infection takes around the world the redistribution of it it's a pain people are undergoing it's a real that's what i always told whatever the cause for it the pain is real and uh, and we are very fortunate to have few molecules to address this issue and thanks to people like you and uh, dr kenneth Lehner and uh, uh, the researcher who spent uh, lot of their efforts in trying to help us to uh, understand exactly how it is working. Insects can be the biggest threats. Yeah. Yes, so the smallest may be very the most dangerous. <laughs> Do you have any idea how these deers and mice that have Lyme disease seem to live normal lives while they're infected the entire time? Uh, they're immune system is not sensitive to the boreal products. So they can live like in synergy with uh, Borrelia. That's why mice and deer, they work like synergy. They never develop any kind of disease. But people found out one mutation can cause the disease in mice. Those animals only, we are using it as an animal model for animal you know, to, for, to do the drug testing and all. And uh, yeah, I think we have some idea why some people develop aggressive disease, some people are not developing that kind of aggressive disease, why some people are okay, you know, they are, uh, uh, respond well to doxycycline, why 15% of the people. We are trying to get some idea 
and why it is happening. Can you summarize for us disulfiram and its potential for treating Lyme disease and co-infections? I really think um, disulfiram is an amazing molecule. As my friend and collaborator, Dr. Kenneth Leiner put it, is kind of uh, delivering it is a huge issue. It's not like a walk in the park, but it's just an amazing molecule. I would love to this molecule to be announced as the molecule of the year in 2020. It's a great molecule. If at all we learn how to deliver effectively, I think uh, uh, the therapy is possible. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Rajadas. And I hopefully will be able to uh, do another one of these interviews with you at some point in the future. Yes, 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 definitely. I'm very happy to be part of it and thank you for your time and all your effort and thank you so much for this amazing website. All <laughs> thank right, you. thank you, doctor. Bye-bye for now. Hey guys, I just wanted to say thanks again for submitting all of the questions and for being so patient with us and getting this video interview released. I also want to give a very special thanks to Kat Lee who did all the video editing and I can't forget Beverly, Fiona, and Joseph who put an enormous amount of effort in selecting, editing, and organize all these questions into one document, which was another monumental task. I can't forget to give Dr. Rajadas a huge thank you for his generosity with his time and for all the amazing work that he's doing for all of us. It honestly was a huge privilege and pleasure to be able to speak with him and for all of us, I'm sure, to be updated on the most cutting-edge research. If you would like to support Dr. Rajadas and his team of scientists doing more work on Borrelia, Bartonella, and Disulfiram, you can now do that through the BioNeomed Foundation, which from my understanding is giving 95% of the donations directly to Dr. Rajadas's team exclusively for Lyme disease research. All right, guys, I will see you again in the future. Thanks again. Bye for now.